My name is Robert Bernstein. I'm the Chief of Staff at Shriners Children's Portland. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about back pain. And then a little further down the line, I'll talk to you a little bit about scoliosis as well. So I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and uh, spend a lot of my time uh, taking care of children with spine problems. So in the past, back pain uh, was believed to be very uncommon in children. And the rate um, has continuously increased as we've done studies over time. And it seems that uh, children uh, can develop back pain uh, more commonly than we used to think. Uh, and then as the child gets older and gets into adolescence and then approaches adulthood, we find um, that the rates of complaint of back pain actually uh, increase uh, to the adult uh, levels. When medical care is sought, however, uh, most of these uh, children, particularly uh, the younger children, will have an identifiable cause. Now, of course, some will not, uh, but we uh, really do try to work up uh, a child who's complaining of back pain. Now, when you look at the differential diagnosis, um, there are a lot of different potential causes of back pain. So there's mechanical, such as trauma, a fracture, or spondylolysis, or spondylolisthesis, or disc herniation. You can see this child uh, doing this gymnastics routine, and just looking at this picture makes my back hurt. Um, postural uh, changes and overuse can uh, increase the complaints of back pain. Um, kids can have a syrinx or a tethered spinal cord as the cause of back pain. And a simply uh, heavy weight, so a high BMI, can be a cause of uh, back pain and back complaints in children. So here's an example of a spondylolysis. You can see the arrow uh, pointing to a stress fracture of the uh, lamina and pars interarticularis uh, on this x-ray. And this is an example of a spondylolisthesis where you can see that the L5 vertebral body has slipped forward on the sacrum. Uh, and so both of these conditions uh, tend to cause back pain. Now, there can be also developmental causes of back pain. So this is an example of a young man who has Schuerman's kyphosis or Schuerman's disease. So Schuerman's disease um, basically is an abnormality of the growth plates in the front of the spine where they don't grow as fast as the growth plates in the back of the spine. So uh, what happens is you wind up with these um, uh, sort of a Roman arch where you have a trapezoidal vertebral body and uh, you get wedging uh, and a very stiff uh, rigid kyphosis, um, and uh, these uh, children frequently complain of significant back pain. So a normal kyphosis in a, uh, in a 10 or a 12 year old would be somewhere around 35 or 40 degrees. Anything over about 45 to 50 degrees is considered abnormal. And when you have this wedging and stiffness of the kyphosis, um, then it would uh, uh, confirm the diagnosis of Schuerman's kyphosis. So this is uh, an example of his uh, x-ray. Other causes of uh, back pain include scoliosis. Um, so um, if you look at uh, the number of patients who have adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, about half of them will complain of some back discomfort. Now in the past, again, we didn't think that that was uh, the case, but as studies have looked more carefully at children who have scoliosis, uh, more and more of them uh, do report complaints of pain. And you can see here uh, in this thoracolumbar curve uh, that the, um, the disc spaces are quite wedged um, and that the facet joints uh, along this area are very likely uh, to see extra wear and tear. And these uh, children are more likely to complain of back pain. There are other, other causes as well. So those would include inflammatory causes such as infection. So uh, you can see a child with osteomyelitis or discitis and rheumatologic uh, causes such as ankylosing spondylitis. So this uh, young lady, uh, as you can see here, you have an MRI that shows a very dark vertebral body. Uh, this uh, young lady had diabetes and has um, a osteomyelitis at uh, the L3 vertebral body and had back pain as her major complaint. Um, this is a, a younger child who has discitis. So discitis is um, actually a form of osteomyelitis where the uh, end plates uh, get infected, the disc uh, space gets infected and you get collapse of the disc and frequently a cause of back pain in younger children. And this young man um, has increased um, uh, sclerosis of his sacroiliac joints on this x-ray 
he came in complaining of uh, back pain and sacroiliac pain, and he has ankylosing spondylitis. Other causes of back pain include neoplasia. So you can have uh, children who will have a bone tumor or a spinal cord tumor uh, or a tumor within the canal. So uh, this uh, picture is one of my patients who has neurofibromatosis and has a large neurofibroma uh, sitting inside the canal and uh, had significant back pain. You can have muscle tumors, metastatic tumors, um, and then you can also have referred pain such as pyelonephritis or cholecystitis can um, uh, cause back pain in children to seek care. So the diagnosis uh, uh, is frequently made based on the history and then uh, confirming it with a physical examination and then some subsequent studies. But the, the history itself is actually very, very important and helps us determine uh, the most likely cause of the back pain in children. So when we're working up a child, uh, we do a very uh, careful history and physical. In the history, we're looking at what's the onset. Did it uh, occur acutely or has it been uh, slowly getting worse over a period of time? Where is the pain? Does it radiate down the legs or just stay in the back? Um, how frequently do they have pain? Uh, what about the duration? Uh, does it last all the time? How, uh, how is the intensity of the pain? And so these are all things that I'll ask on my uh, evaluation uh, to try and uh, get an idea of what's going on with the child. In the history, um, we look at uh, we look for some uh, specific red flags, uh, such as night pain. Now, when we talk about night pain, night pain means that the child wakes up in the middle of the night complaining of back pain, not that the child goes to bed complaining of back pain and then falls asleep. So if a child is waking up every single night after falling asleep, they wake up every single night with pain in their back, that's a bad sign and would suggest an infection or a tumor. Do they respond to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications? So osteoid osteoma is a frequent benign tumor of the spine that can cause a significant back pain, but has a very uh, wonderful response to uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Does the pain interfere with the child's ability to participate in play? So this is another red flag. If the child stops participating in activities that they normally enjoy doing because their back is hurting, uh, it would suggest that there's some real pathology going on. What motions cause the pain? So these are things that I'll ask, does it hurt if you bend forward or does it hurt if you bend backwards? So hyperextension of the spine increases the pressure on the posterior elements. Uh, so you're more likely to have um, extension pain uh, being related to spondylolysis. On the other hand, if you have a disc herniation, flexing forward, bending down increases the pressure on the disc, which will then uh, increase the amount of discomfort that the child will complain of. Weight loss, fevers, and other, other generalized symptoms is another red flag. If a child comes in with back pain and they're losing weight or they're having fevers or other types of symptoms like this, that again is a very worrisome sign. Are they having neurologic symptoms? Are they complaining of numbness or weakness in their legs? Are they um, having difficulty controlling bowel and bladder? Those should be very uh, consistent screening questions for you to ask to determine whether uh, something is going on that's affecting the nerves. So again, uh, a very significant red flag. Back pain in children under the age of five years is pretty unusual. So if a, a, a child comes in um, at four years of age uh, complaining of back pain or three years of age complaining of back pain, we take that very seriously. Sometimes it's something benign, such as uh, an uncomfortable car seat, and we can adjust the car seat, and then the child seems to not have uh, discomfort. But age under five years should also be considered a red flag. And then pain that actually remains present for more than four weeks. So if the chronicity of the pain is longer than a month, uh, we begin to worry that there's something uh, more serious going on. Now, each and every one of these red flags doesn't mean that there's something terrible happening if the child has a red flag, but it means that we need to look a little bit deeper. So in the history, we'll talk about neurologic complaints. Again, numbness or weakness, jumpy legs. Um, are they having bowel or bladder changes? Are they having gait changes where they're having difficulty walking, stumbling, things like that that would indicate that, that uh, there's a back problem, excuse me, a neurologic problem going on. 
Then we would look at their physical examination, look at their back alignment, uh, both the coronal and sagittal plane. So here's a young lady who uh, came in with back pain and scoliosis, but if you look a little carefully, she has cafe au lait spots. And in fact, she has uh, type one neurofibromatosis. So we're looking for rashes, other marks in the midline defects. Uh, so hairy patches in the midline, things like that, they would suggest that there's an underlying pathology in the spinal canal itself. Uh, look for a leg length discrepancy, uh, especially when you're looking for uh, scoliosis, make sure that they don't have a substantial leg length discrepancy. A child that comes in uh, with a back complaint and has a significant leg length discrepancy, that could be the result of a neurologic abnormality. It could be that their back pain is simply there because they have a substantial leg length discrepancy, but important to, to uh, assess. Again, we talked about flexion and extension. So here's a child who um, has a significant pathology in his back. He in fact actually has a spondylolysis, but he doesn't like to bend forward interestingly. And he stopped playing basketball because his back was hurting so much. Pain to palpation and percussion. So when I examine a child's back who's complaining of pain, I'll gently tap on their back with my uh, fist and see if that causes them pain. An infection or a tumor in the vertebral body will make them jump. I'm not doing this very hard, but doing it fairly softly, but uh, it does give us an indication of whether there's some underlying pathology that I need to look in that particular area. Watch their gait. Do they have asymmetric movement when they are starting to walk? Um, do a very careful neurologic examination. So deep tendon reflexes and abdominal reflexes. So uh, you should either have no abdominal reflex to either side, or you should have a symmetric abdominal reflex going to each side. But an asymmetric abdominal reflex can be uh, a sign of an underlying intraspinal abnormality. Do a good motor examination. Can they walk on their tiptoes? Can they walk on their heels? Um, can they hop uh, on one leg? Things like that that help us get an idea of how their muscles are functioning. Um, a sensory examination. Do they have normal sensation? Uh, things like that. A straight leg raise. So um, have them lie down on the, in the supine position and perform a straight leg raise. Does that cause significant uh, radiation of the pain down the leg, which would give us an indication of a disc herniation or some uh, similar type of pathology? A Faber test, which is flexion, abduction, and external rotation, where you uh, place a hand on the opposite uh, iliac crest and then uh, abduct and externally rotate uh, the ipsilateral leg and press, and that gives you a good stress to the uh, sacroiliac joint. <clears throat> Once I've had a chance to examine the child and hopefully have a better idea of what I'm looking for, uh, then I'll do uh, some radiographic studies. And usually the best place to start is with good quality uh, x-rays. So an AP and lateral radiograph of the spine is important. Now, there are other studies that we may choose to get, and that can be a bone scan, an MRI, or a CT scan, but it really depends on where the history and physical is leading us. So here's a child who came in uh, with a significant back pain. In fact, she came in in a wheelchair because she didn't like to walk anymore, and she had this very substantial scoliosis. And you can see it's not the typical scoliosis that you would normally see in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. When we took a lateral x-ray, you can see that she had this very significant spondylolisthesis and she had compression of her nerve roots uh, uh, in that area, which we uh, found uh, later on MRI. And here's her MRI and you can see the very tight spinal canal, uh, which is caused by the uh, PARS uh, defect and the slippage of L5 on S1, pulling the lamina forward and uh, causing a uh, spinal stenosis in the area. Uh, other uh, studies that we frequently will get are CBC, said, uh, uh, ESR, and uh, C-reactive protein, sometimes ANA, rheumatoid factor, and HLA-B27, depending on whether we're uh, considering other um, rheumatologic conditions, and some other studies on occasion as well. But sort of the, the most important things are to start with a, CB, uh, with a CBC, said, rate, and C-reactive protein, looking for inflammation, um, and again, uh, the basic x-rays.
Now, this is an algorithm uh, that I published uh, in the American Family Physician in 2007, but it serves as a good uh, way of running through things, obviously starting with your history and physical examination. And if um, everything is really normal and they have nonspecific back pain, trying anti-inflammatory medication, maybe some physical therapy and things to see how they do over a period of months. On the other hand, if they don't improve or they have an abnormal uh, finding on their physical examination, then you uh, proceed with radiography, um, which would be anterior and lateral views. Uh, consider getting laboratory studies, again, ESR, CRP, and uh, complete blood count, um, and then determining uh, based on those results whether uh, you go on to treat the diagnosis or if you get negative results or indeterminate results, then proceeding with either an MRI or a CT scan, uh, depending on what it is that you're looking for. If all of these are negative, uh, which is a rare occasion, uh, we will occasionally refer the patient to pain management. What about treatment for uh, back pain? Well, uh, we try to target the uh, treatment uh, of the underlying cause. So if none is identified, if we can't come up with a cause, then um, activity modification to try and decrease the amount of discomfort that that child is having. Core strengthening and physical therapy. Now, um, one of the problems uh, with putting a child in physical therapy uh, is that they will go to a physical therapist once or twice a week and think that they're doing uh, enough physical therapy. Whereas truly physical therapy is seven days a week. And so I explained to the family that we're going to put you in physical therapy. The physical therapist is gonna see you once or twice a week to go over the exercises and to make sure that you're doing them correctly but physical therapy is seven days a week at home and you need to be doing these exercises uh, every single day. Now the core strengthening itself doesn't necessarily make the back pain go away. Um, if you have mechanical back pain that is uh, simply uh, causing discomfort, the, the physical therapy itself is gonna take a long time to have a, a positive effect, but people who have really good core strength tend to have less back discomfort. We use uh, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatories, but we use them judiciously. So I don't generally put somebody on non-steroidals for a month or two months or three months, but I will have them take the medication for a week um, on a consistent basis to see if it will significantly decrease their pain and then taper off that medication as they're getting into physical therapy and doing more. So again, very judicious use of non not putting them on it for long periods of time. The other thing that I often um, ask uh, the family is what anti-inflammatories they've been using and what dose they've been using. So frequently I find in my practice that the uh, pediatrician uh, will make a suggestion of a dose, uh, but the family will cut the dose in half because they don't want their child taking uh, medication. So they'll, instead of using 600 milligrams of uh, ibuprofen for a, a adult sized child, they'll be giving the child 200 milligrams, which of course is not gonna have much effect. Um, the other thing that I uh, consider is uh, the use of omega-3 fatty acids and some other anti-inflammatory uh, homeopathic cures uh, uh, that can decrease inflammation. So omega-3 fatty acids have a, uh, uh, an effect on uh, the arachidonic acid um, uh, uh, metabolic uh, uh, program and uh, can uh, slightly decrease inflammation. There's some good literature in the rheumatoid uh, literature uh, of uh, people uh, that could not tolerate non steroidal anti-inflammatories or methotrexate. So this is uh, years ago, and they were placed on very high dose omega-3 fatty acids uh, with substantial improvement in their uh, rheumatologic pain. So uh, sometimes uh, omega-3 fatty acids are a good option for families who don't wanna be uh, on non steroidal anti-inflammatories on a regular basis. Weight loss um, is also uh, a big um, uh, Treatment, um, I talk to families uh, quite a bit about uh, weight loss, not just for their back pain, but also for their general health. Um, sometimes uh, this is a difficult conversation to have with the family. And frequently, if we have a child who comes in with a high BMI, 
the family members also have a very high BMI. And I explained to them that weight loss is not a diet, but a change in uh, nutrition status, uh, a change in habit, uh, a change in lifestyle. So instead of um, eating uh, three burritos uh, uh, for lunch, uh, it means having salads, uh, becoming uh, more uh, of a vegetarian type of diet and things like that, where they can um, exercise more and take fewer calories in to uh, lose weight. But that's always a very difficult conversation with the family. So in summary, um, a child that comes in with a significant back pain um, will frequently have uh, an abnormality. Uh, the younger the child, the more likely you are to find something abnormal um, on their examination. Um, so it has a relatively high yield. The history usually helps us determine the seriousness and uh, gives us uh, a lot of hints towards the diagnosis. So spend time when you're talking to these uh, uh, children, um, where does it hurt? When does it hurt? When did it start? Does it radiate? Do you have pain with Valsalva? If you cough or sneeze, do you get the pain? Um, do you have numbness, weakness? Do you wake up in the middle of the night? Look for those red flags. Then uh, physical examination and radiographs will often help you confirm the diagnosis, and then you can uh, intervene. Um, so when should you be worried? What are the red flags? Just to reiterate, systemic symptoms, so weight loss, fevers, things like that are very worrisome. Self-imposed limitations. Um, so the child that stops participating in sports or won't play with other children because their back hurts, that's a sign of, of something significant pain at night that wakes the child up on a consistent basis uh, is, is a worrisome sign. Again, there are a number of kids who will come in with mechanical back pain who say my back hurts when I go to bed, but then I fall asleep and I stay asleep all night long. That to me is not usually worrisome. Whereas the child who says I wake up every night around two in the morning with terrible back pain, I'm looking for something bad. Neurologic symptoms, numbness, weakness, bowel or bladder complaints, things like that. So I ask every child, are you having difficulty controlling going to the bathroom? Do you ever have accidents, soil your underwear, things like that? Um, and that can be embarrassing, but I explain to the families that it's very, very important for us to know whether they're having any changes there. Children who are under the age of five, again, that's a worrisome sign. And so we look uh, very carefully at those children and then pain lasting more than four weeks. So if you were gonna take something from this, uh, this uh, talk, uh, these are the red flags that you should have in the back of your mind when you're uh, evaluating a child who's complaining of back pain. Now I'm gonna turn uh, the discussion over to uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis uh, so that uh, you have the opportunity to uh, understand a little bit more about scoliosis. Um, so, um, there's a normal uh, spinal alignment um, that we see in, um, in uh, uh, normal patients. So uh, in, the lateral, um, in the lateral view or sagittal view, you should have a thoracic kyphosis, which is mild, and you should have a lumbar lordosis or a swayback, which is mild, and that, that is the normal alignment of the spine. In the frontal plane, uh, so on an AP x-ray, um, your spine should be essentially straight. So what does scoliosis mean? Well, scolio means curved or bent in Greek. And so scoliosis is a fixed lateral curvature of the spine of greater than 10 degrees. So that's an uh, arbitrary de uh, definition, uh, but um, accepted by the medical community. So somebody who has a, a lateral curvature of six or seven degrees uh, on an x-ray does not by definition have true scoliosis, but somebody who has a fixed lateral curvature over 10 degrees does have a scoliosis. And I think it's important uh, for us to consider uh, that uh, because you don't want to label somebody with a pre-existing condition if they don't actually meet the diagnostic criteria. So again, something over 10 degrees uh, will uh, give you the diagnosis of scoliosis. <clears throat> Now, scoliosis um, actually has multiple etiologies. So I think it's important to think of scoliosis as a phenotype, um, but not a diagnosis. So you can have vertebral anomalies, so abnormalities in the way that the uh, spine is put together. So that's congenital scoliosis. You can have scoliosis from neurologic conditions. So uh, polio, 
uh, was a cause of scoliosis in the past. You can have uh, scoliosis from cerebral palsy or things like that that cause uh, curvature of the spine. Muscular diseases uh, can cause scoliosis as well. So uh, Friedrich's ataxia or uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy frequently result in a child who eventually develops a curvature of the spine. Idiopathic scoliosis, which is considered the most common type of scoliosis and what we're gonna focus on here, but there are even other causes of scoliosis that you should be aware of. Keep in mind, scoliosis is a phenotype. So once you see that there's a curvature, you're not done. You haven't made the diagnosis yet. You've all, all you've done is identify a phenotype. The child has a curvature. Now we have to figure out why they have the curvature. So again, we start off with the history. Um, uh, history of the pregnancy and birth, I think, is important because uh, that'll give you hints as to whether the child could have uh, a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, past medical history uh, of the child, family history. Is there a history of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy in the family? Uh, is there a history of spinal muscular atrophy? Other types of things. When was the curvature first noticed? So we actually define scoliosis as three different types, infantile, juvenile, and adolescent, and they're based on when the diagnosis is made. So if the diagnosis is made at uh, two years of age, that child has, by definition, infantile idiopathic scoliosis. If the diagnosis is identified at four years of age, that child has juvenile, so juveniles between ages three and 10. And if the child is identified to have scoliosis after age 10, then we would uh, consider that most likely to be adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Do they have numbness or weakness uh, in their upper or lower extremities? So again, very, very important bowel and bladder uh, complaints that might lead you away from the diagnosis of idiopathic scoliosis and towards something uh, more sinister, either within the canal or, uh, uh, or, system, or systemic. General examination is pretty standard. Um, it hasn't changed for about 150 years and that's the Adams forward bend test. So here's a, a patient of mine from a number of years ago bending forward and you can see the very significant um, chest wall deformity uh, that gives her that rim prominence uh, consistent with scoliosis. It's important to check and make sure that they don't have a leg length discrepancy uh, because a leg length discrepancy can make them look like they have a symmetry of their back and a true scoliosis. This device is called the scoliometer. I'm not uh, suggesting that you go out and buy this particular device. I don't own any uh, um, uh, stock in this company or any other company that makes a scoliometer, uh, but you can get this. It's basically a ship's level that you place over the spine, and it is a nice uh, uh, non-invasive uh, way of determining when you should get an x-ray. So this is one of my nurses uh, from a number of years ago. Uh, she does not have scoliosis, but she took off of one of her clogs. So now she has a leg length discrepancy and she bends forward. And now you can see that she has the asymmetry of her back. So again, very important for you to look for a leg length discrepancy. Uh, and you, if you do identify a child as having a leg length discrepancy, you need to equalize that leg length discrepancy before you do their forward bend test to look for asymmetry of the spine. So you can see where the little marble uh, rolls in the scoliometer and anything uh, seven degrees or greater should be referred to a pediatric orthopedic surgeon for evaluation. Um, now, sometimes you can get x-rays in your own office, uh, but in general, I recommend that you send the patient uh, to a pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, so that the x-rays can be obtained there. Many of the um, uh, x-ray suites in general radiology uh, offices do not have the ability of obtaining an x-ray that includes the entire spine. And in fact, if the child comes to me with a spot view of the thoracic spine and a spot view of the lumbar spine, I have to repeat those x-rays and get a full spine x-ray on one film. Uh, so you'd like to avoid the extra radiation exposure if possible. Do your examination, look for skin markings. Again, here's that child who uh, came in with cafe au lait spots uh, and has neurofibromatosis. Examination, do a motor exam, both the upper and lower extremities. Uh, you wanna make sure that they have normal strength, normal reflexes, both upper and lower extremities. Look for a clonus, uh, check their abdominal reflexes and such to, uh, to be sure that neurologically everything appears to be normal. 
Here's a child who um, I saw a number of years ago who on her examination had a completely normal upper and lower extremity motor function. Her deep tendon reflexes were normal, but she had an asymmetric abdominal reflex. And based on that, we obtained an MRI and you can see that she has a very large cervical syrinx. Um, get some studies. Uh, we like to start simple again. So x-rays are the best studies to obtain. So a plain radiograph is important, just a simple uh, AP. And again, I would recommend that these radiographs be done in an orthopedic office where they have access to 36 inch cassettes. So we don't have to repeat x-rays that are taken as spot views. So if we look at this child and I magnify the x-ray, you can see actually there are two hemivertebra here. So this child does not have adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, but in fact has congenital scoliosis. Uh, so there are two hemivertebrae there that we can identify uh, that changes the diagnosis and it also changes the studies that we need to get. Because the spine forms at the same time as the heart and the kidneys in the uh, embryo, uh, these children need to have a cardiac examination uh, and they also need to have a renal ultrasound to confirm that there's no renal anomalies. So when you see a child who has congenital scoliosis, think heart and kidneys. MRIs can sometimes be helpful. I don't get them routinely unless I find that the child has a neurologic abnormality or if the curve is rapidly progressive, excuse me, progressive or if it's something that I think is truly atypical. And I always get an MRI prior to surgery in patients who have neurofibromatosis or congenital scoliosis. So up to a third of children with congenital scoliosis will have an intraspinal anomaly, anything from a syrinx, a tethered cord, uh, to a diastematomyelia. Um, neurofibromatosis uh, can have tumors within the canal or rib heads can be dislocated into the canal. And I'd like to know that before I try and straighten the child's spine uh, for surgery. If I get the MRI, I always get the entire spine. So that's occiput to sacrum. So if a child comes in with a lumbar scoliosis, they're gonna get occiput to sacrum MRI if I feel that I need it. Um, but I'm not gonna just get an MRI of the lumbar spine. If I end up having to send that child to a neurosurgeon, the neurosurgeon is going to require the cervical and thoracic spine as well as the lumbar spine. So if you're gonna put the child to sleep or the child needs to get an MRI uh, without sleep, get the entire spine. Now, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the most common type of scoliosis that you're gonna see. And it represents about 85% of the children that will come into your office with scoliosis. These children are otherwise healthy. And if you uh, break down idiopathic, uh, idio uh, means proper to or peculiar to oneself. So idiopathic means that the scoliosis is uh, 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 peculiar to that one person, but again, it's the most common type of scoliosis that you'll see. There are lots of potential possibilities as to the cause of idiopathic scoliosis. It could be neurologic. We certainly know that there's some hereditary uh, factors involved, uh, but it's going to be multifactorial. There are a number of studies trying to evaluate genes to determine which genes are more common in families that have scoliosis. For example, my mother had a very severe scoliosis. I don't have scoliosis. My brother and my sister don't have scoliosis, but my brother's oldest daughter has a mild curve. So it's definitely got some uh, hereditary component. Um, hormonal uh, abnormalities, collagen abnormalities have also been looked at uh, in a number of studies and may hold some clues as to the actual cause of scoliosis. Again, idiopathic scoliosis. Again, we subclassify idiopathic scoliosis based on age. So infantile is defined as zero to three years of age. It's more common in, in boys than it is in girls. Um, a number of uh, infantile cases, if they're mild, will actually resolve um, on their own, but some of them can be uh, quite severe. Juvenile is defined as three to 10 years of age. So that's when the diagnosis of scoliosis is made. And adolescent is after age 10 years to maturity. And of course, in adolescent scoliosis, you see more females uh, with significant involvement than males. Now in the juvenile group, there's uh, actually a higher incidence of intraspinal anomaly. So up to 20% of children 
who uh, initially are diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic scoliosis will end up having uh, an abnormality on MRI. So most of those children, particularly uh, uh, those with a significant curve, we go over with a fine tooth comb neurologically and very frequently will get an MRI to make sure that the spinal cord is normal. So keep in mind that scoliosis is a three-dimensional uh, abnormality, so it's not just a side-to-side -side curvature. So here you can see this uh, young lady again bending forward and she has the rib uh, uh, changes. So the ribs themselves actually remodel and you can see what this does to the chest wall. So um, both sides of the chest are abnormal. So the, the right side of her chest has this uh, rib prominence and the left side of the chest, actually those ribs are pushed down. So here you can see that this side is not normal and this side is not normal. And then you can here see the cross-sectional area and it has changed the shape of her chest. So it's a uh, abnormality that involves lateral flexion, rotation, and extension. And most uh, idiopathic scoliosis is lordoscoliosis where they go into extension, not kyphosis. If we look at um, the patients who have uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, the risk of progression is uh, generally related to their maturity, um, the size of the curve and the location of the curve. So the younger they are, uh, the more growth they have, the more likely that uh, curvature is going to get worse uh, as they grow. And so you can see here, if the curve magnitude is under 20 degrees and the child is 16 years of age, there's a very low probability that the curve is going to uh, worsen over time. Whereas if they're very young and they come into your office and they have a curve over 60 degrees, there's virtually 100% chance that curve will continue to progress throughout their lifetime. The natural history of scoliosis, again, 70% of the children that you'll see with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis will um, not progress. Um, generally, in the milder curves, it's a cosmetic problem. So this young lady, you can see that she has this asymmetry of her waist, and she didn't like the way she looks uh, in her prom dress, and so came in uh, because of this curve. Now, in her, her curve is lower down in the lumbar spine. It's not going to cause significant asymmetry of the chest wall, uh, but it's going to give her significant um, asymmetry of the back. Progression can cause imbalance in these children. So you can see again in her uh, uh, picture there. Um, pulmonary and cardiac compromise are rare. Uh, and these occur when curves approach uh, between 80 and 100 degrees. Um, and those curves are usually in the thoracic spine where you get significant asymmetry uh, and narrowing of the chest wall. So lumbar curves and thoracolumbar curves rarely cause any um, uh, organ compromise. Again, the amount of growth is very important. Um, if the curve is going is getting worse, uh, progression before skeletal maturity can uh, increase up to about two degrees a month. So that's a fairly rapid increase in curve. Um, after skeletal maturity, particularly in the thoracic spine, um, once the child is completely mature, uh, the curve may get worse very slowly over time, but often only about a degree a year. So it takes quite a number of years to determine that that curve continues to get worse. What are our treatment options? Well, uh, there are a number. Um, the most common, obviously, is observation. So if we have a child that comes in uh, with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and a 15-degree curve, we're going to observe that child uh, during their growth and get um, x-rays on an every six-month basis just to make sure that the curve is not progressive. Um, sometimes we'll utilize a brace. So when the curve approaches 20 degrees or greater, uh, we may choose to brace the curve. And so this is an example of uh, an old brace called the Milwaukee brace, which was quite successful, but very few children would uh, be willing to wear this brace anymore. Um, other braces include uh, the Boston brace, the um, uh, Providence brace, the Charleston brace. So there's multiple braces that are basically named after cities. Uh, and these have actually been shown to be quite successful in preventing curve progression. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we did a, a study uh, throughout the country where we uh, randomly uh, selected um, 
uh, hospitals that would treat children with a brace or not treat children with a brace to determine whether um, the bracing could actually prevent curve progression. And after uh, about two years of the study, the FDA stopped uh, the study and said that there was uh, such significant uh, prevention of curve progression in the braced patients and the unbraced patients wound up with so much more surgery uh, that it was clear to them that bracing works and they uh, recommended that we discontinue the study. Uh, another thing that you may hear about is tethering. Now, this is a little bit more experimental, and that's where um, a surgeon will do an operation and put in screws and a Dacron cable uh, that tethers the spine into a straighter position. So it's an effort not to perform uh, an actual fusion and uh, make the spine solid. Uh, and there's some evidence that this can actually improve uh, the, the curve uh, while not having to wind up with a fusion, uh, but this is still very early in its infancy. And then finally, uh, the most common operation that you'll see for a progressive idiopathic scoliosis is spinal fusion. So when do we brace? We'll brace if the child is skeletally immature and the curve is between 20 and 45 degrees. Once the curve gets over about 45 degrees, a brace is not going to work. Uh, and generally we don't brace curves under 20 degrees. We brace that child until they're skeletally mature. Once they reach skeletal maturity, the brace really is no longer effective. And of course the child isn't going to want to continue to wear the brace throughout their lifetime. And again, the BRACE study, which was published in 2013, randomly selected patients uh, or centers that would BRACE or not BRACE. And again, they found that those who were BRACED were much less likely to go on to require surgical intervention. So bracing does prevent progression of scoliosis. Here's an example of tethering. Uh, again, this is uh, only for patients who have idiopathic scoliosis who have significant growth remaining. Uh, generally, the child needs to be um, at least eight years of age and would otherwise uh, go on to need a fusion. So here's uh, a um, young lady who had this significant curve and had uh, this tethering performed. It's still an operation. Uh, so in other words, it's an effort to modulate growth, to straighten the spine and get the spine to grow straighter. On occasion, these cables break and need to be um, revised and up to 25% uh, of these patients will need a second operation. So again, uh, this is a very new procedure. Um, it, I would consider uh, still fairly experimental, although it's gaining more and more acceptance uh, and will have a place in the treatment of children who have significant scoliosis that have significant growth available. Um, fusion, uh, we'll do that if the child has a thoracic curve of about 45 to 50 degrees or more, if their curve is rapidly progressive and we cannot control that curve in a brace, if they're very significantly out of balance. So here's a girl who uh, had this significant imbalance. Uh, she also had some back discomfort. Um, she had a thoracolumbar curve and you can see if you look Carefully, uh, she has a little scar here on her side. So she had an anterior spinal fusion uh, where we only fused, I think, three vertebral bodies in this child uh, and were able to get her to straighten up considerably, uh, improve her overall alignment uh, and uh, decrease her back discomfort. This is an example, uh, it's not the same child, but this is an example of an anterior spinal fusion where you've got screws and a rod very similar uh, effectively to that tether, except that it's a rigid uh, device that uh, results in a fusion. The most common operation you'll see is a posterior spinal fusion with instrumentation. Uh, so here you can see uh, before and after this child having uh, uh, posterior spinal fusion, you've got rods and hooks and or screws where we push the spine into a straighter position. We lay bone along the sides of the spine so that it all becomes reinforced concrete and she no longer moves in those areas, but the curve stops progressing. So in summary, Back pain is uh, very common uh, in children, but under age five, you should be very concerned about it. Um, the frequency seems to increase with age. Look for identifiable, identifiable causes of back pain and do a careful history and physical examination. Um, if you find the identifiable cause, then obviously treat it. Um, if there's no identifiable cause, then frequently we will treat back pain with activity modification physical uh, therapy and core strengthening, 
uh, judicious use of non steroidal anti inflammatory medication, and weight loss. For scoliosis, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis represents about 85% of the children who will come into your office who have a curvature of their spine. There does seem to be a hereditary component, although there may be other causes of the curve as well. We look for other causes of scoliosis. So remember, scoliosis itself is just a phenotype and you want to rule out a neurologic condition or a muscular condition or some other cause of the scoliosis. Treatments uh, can include observation, bracing, tethering, and fusion. And here are some uh, information about our contact uh, for Shriners Children's Portland. Uh, so the uh, main number, 503-221-3422, and our fax number below that, 503-221-3483. We also, by the way, have a physician-to-physician -physician line, which is manned essentially 24-7, uh, 365. That is, that if you have a question about a patient and need a uh, to speak with a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, if you dial 971-282-4600, uh, we will get you connected with one of our pediatric orthopedic surgeons and they can help answer your questions. We also have email uh, at uh, newpatient at shrinenet.org uh, and you can go on to the website and uh, look at shrinerschildrens.org. So I wanna thank you for your uh, attention and hopefully uh, you found this presentation to be somewhat useful uh, in your practice. Uh, and if you have any uh, questions, um, there are ways to get in touch with me uh, through the uh, numbers or website that we just provided to you. Thank you so much.